So hello everybody. I'm going to introduce the concept of the next assignment to you and then we're going to do primarily homework review on the layered painting because I'm sure you guys want to see that. Uh, I've got all the articles up here which are available to you right now. Texture painting is what we're going to get into. So working with 3D models. This is not a 3D modeling class so I'm not going to go over that but I'm going to go over the aspect of decorating and creating the various kinds of maps and the formatting for textures and I've got a really easy 3D online viewer that we can all use without any training really whatsoever. So this article is available to you in which I describe what texturing is, basic file structure, um, some problems that can occur and how to solve them and then our assignment is going to be to texture one of the three available files. Uh oh, I didn't list them. I'm going to have to list them. They're in here anyway. In the Google Drive folders, that's my other one. In our Google Drive folders, in resources, 3D models, we've got three folders and that's because these files are very specifically named and they need to stay that way. So when you guys turn in your homework, you're going to have to turn in a folder with really just the texture file but if you want to put all three in there they're tiny so it's okay just drop them all three in and then I can view things rapidly but one of the keys is this is, is that you cannot rename your texture file it has to be the same as you got it so here we've got a gravestone a pumpkin unwrapped one way just in case it's confusing I have a pumpkin unwrapped a different way and I'll show you what all three of those look like right now this is the website I refer to in the articles and the instructions are just to drag the three files that are provided in each of those folders into here. So if we take a quick look there is a .obj which is an object, there's a .mtl which is a material and that tells it how to find texture files, and then there's the actual texture file which the default is just a little kind of hard to see mesh looking thing but we're going to treat that like a coloring book and fill it in with all of our relevant details. So I've got a few examples on my desktop. I'll just grab all three. Here they are. Drop them right in the window. And then here is one of the three options. So this gravestone is multicolored because it makes it easier to tell where detail is in the um, texture sheet. Then we've got pumpkin number two. There he is. Got a little sample face on him. Okay. And this one has two faces because of the way I unwrapped it to give it more space for your painting. And then pumpkin number one, which is unwrapped slightly different. You can see the face is a bit smaller, but higher resolution. And he doesn't have a second face in the back this time. So all sorts of information about how to actually accomplish this. Double check back and forth. Um, some problems that can occur like these seams, which aren't really a big deal in this case, but there are ways to solve that and we will get more complex as we go throughout the course. Any questions about that? Nope. Cool. Yes. yes. Salvo, you've done this before. You don't need any questions. But go ahead. So, uh, can we use a, a Maya file? Um, another type of uh, file instead of Maya? If you know how to export these things so that I can view it in this online viewer, yes. But make sure that you actually know how to do that correctly. I'm not really going to explain how, yes. but suffice to say, you need an object file, you need a material file, which means your original object had to have a material applied with a file already associated with it and it's got to be named correctly and then you have these three in our work as long as you can make that work properly absolutely okay okay great so there you go catch up on all of that so that you'll be ready for the next class meeting so let's go back to oh by the way i have um mine in here. I added that on top because I thought it was funny and it looked like he was thinking really hard. But I did post the uh, one that I did on Discord, which was basically about this level. I don't think I took it anything past here, but all of the basics were in there, so just in case you wanted to see mine. 
So I wanted to see how all these turned out, and I actually haven't looked in this folder at all. So hopefully it went well for you guys, but if you have any comments before I start going through it, go ahead and say them now. Was this hard? Was this easy? In the middle. In the middle? I would say it's probably uh, the harder one of the assignments we've had so far. Sure. What was difficult about it for you? Me personally, it was probably just uh, just because it was a new concept trying to make like a, a 3D kind of visual from a 2D picture. Sure. Yeah. Harder than it looks for sure. Yeah, I, I totally get that. Uh, yeah. And there are many different ways to work in um, digital paint. This one I'm describing is one of the most robust and it utilizes all of the digital kind of advantages that you can have. Uh, various layers, adjustment styles and blending modes. All of that stuff is an advantage for digital art, but it's a complication as well. There's really at the end of the day nothing stopping you from just painting on a single layer as if it were a traditional canvas and just taking the responsibility of everything onto you and your hand-eye coordination. So that's another way that sometimes people use digital paint and it's one that I actually really like as well. So just to keep in mind that there's more than one approach. This one's not an approach I oftentimes use but it is a really widespread and popular one. Elias says he sees the importance, although um, he'd like more practice with it. Yeah, absolutely. Should do more practice. Very good. I definitely did not redo shadows around seven times. Okay. <laughs> That's a suspicious way to say that, but all right. Uh, Salvo requested that we take a look at his first, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. There we go. And that's great. We've got the nice uh, uh, rhinoceros character there. Looks like we've got a good shadow direction from this side over here. Um, some of these shadows are maybe a little bit misreading uh, because this one indicates that the shadow is coming from the lower left, but this one indicates that the shadow is coming from the upper left. So just keep in mind that it's not always just going to be kind of an edge on the object. The direction is going to change the nature of that shadow a lot. And so really just on that one horn is the place that I see it kind of going awry. The rest of it looks like it's pretty consistent overall. Also bear in mind that some things have form that is not immediately apparent, like this chef hat. The chef hat is indicating that there's a, a bulge, a bulge, a bulge, a bulge, which would mean that this shadow should follow that and maybe you'd get a little secondary wispy shadow on the other turning forms. It's like there's several different cylinders or seven, several different spheres. So you can get just like a partial shadow sometimes where it's very hazy. You can get a full shadow. And then also this cylinder would probably be a little bit further in than that. Okay, just tips like that. But in general, pretty good. I mean, this looks consistent enough for me. It looks like you use the techniques properly. Maybe just a little bit dark on this cast shadow in the background, but overall working. Any questions or comments from Salvo? No. Good. All right. Very good. Thanks for the feedback. Yeah. I'm just going to go through, I think, the list because we can get through this pretty quick. Uh, if anybody wants to chime in with comments on their own, then that would be fine with me. Let's take a look at uh, Nate's first because he's got the only folder here. So we've got Tom Nook and Tom Nook with the shading. I kind of like to see that difference. Look at that. What a difference that makes, huh? This is like cut out illustration. And then we've got a much more solid three dimensional looking almost clay figurine or plastic figurine there. So yeah, that's working. What's the third one? Okay, here it is without any of the local colors at all. Yeah, it's fun to see the difference between all three because then you can really appreciate how much work you ended up doing on it. But yeah, this looks great. I would say that it might be going a little bit too far to have an actual shadow over the eyelid like that, unless we're treating him like a toy. But uh, it doesn't look super strange. It's just a little bit of an odd thing that I kind of picked up on. Uh, in general, I think you've got the idea down pat. Uh, let me check the... 
So the only thing I would say is the lighting direction is a little bit vague to me. I can see the shadow and generally I'd say this side of the objects is brighter but we've got so much occlusion that it's kind of blending around everywhere and it's making it a little bit hard to tell where the light's coming from. Not that it's really detracting from it very much, it's just something that I would watch out for. Like for instance, this shadow here probably wouldn't occur if we were going in that direction for real. This would be an occlusion only, not a cast shadow like that. That's almost like there's a light underneath the tie. And yeah, it is really good. This is exactly what I was hoping for. Looks like it utilizes all the techniques. And this one's especially fun to look at because we can see all the, the real work is here because this one is probably a lot easier to do. Just nice solid colors. Cool. Any comments from you, Nathan? My, my proudest part is the uh, logo at the bottom. Oh, putting these down? You didn't recreate them, right? No, I okay. just got them from the internet. Good. I'm glad you didn't recreate them because that would have been too much work. Because you, you could. It's just, holy crap, it would take a lot of work. But yeah, that makes it really look authentic. It looks like genuine you know, advertisement art for this crossover. Very good. All right, thank you. Let's take a look at Alex. Okay, pretty good. I could see a sense of direction and we're going up the nose. So this is what I'm talking about, like a secondary form where this sticks out. So this kind of travels up and then it resumes down here because that's just the face. This is where it would have gone if there was no nose at all. And then this is where it's going because there's a, a lifted form here. So that works out for me, that's nice. Um, a little bit strange here in that it looks like we've got a cast shadow from his head onto his ears, which would indicate a low, maybe central light going straight at the character. But this indicates that there's a light way up on top shining down in this direction. So try to keep it consistent. Um, it's really easy to mix up light sources and kind of shuffle them around and not pay attention to the direction. But the more that you pay attention to direction, the more real it feels. Because instead of talking to our conscious mind, you start talking to our unconscious that's just used to seeing real shadows all day, every day. And that makes it an especially convincing effect. Shadow underneath the head looks good. I like how it wraps around these ties. I love that I can see the shape of this knot here. Uh, the casting of the shadow off of the chest is excellent because look at that, it's sticking away from the chest. So this part is farther and this part is a lot closer. That makes 100% sense, very good. Uh, the one thing I'll say that you got wrong as far as detail is these arms were actually free floating. They weren't tucked under anything and it looks like you're tucking his arm underneath his waistband there. So just don't do that. The, the game is a little bit weird in that their arms all float in midair next to them. Um, so that's probably why we got a mix up there. Trying to have the ear cast a bit the ear bit cast from the hat, but I see why that would seem different. Yeah, it's because we've got light on the front of the face, right? The hat is on, we'll be generous and say the very top of his head, but really it's the back of the head. So if there's light on the front of this, there would be light on the front of this and all shadows would go back. So you're saying that hat would shine back on the ear. That's this part right here, but not this part over here. Right? That part looks like it's the skull. So for the, the vertical line though, that would make sense that we'd get a little cash out of there. And you did it over on this side as well, which I think makes sense. Very good. All right, thank you. All right, so we've got Avil. I think that's how I say that. Yep, you're here in, in chat. Okay, so we've got some comments on here already. I followed all the steps from the lecture, but the drawing turned out like this, and anything I did to fix it didn't work. Uh, do you have any idea what went wrong? Um, no. What I did notice is when I was trying to use the mask, or the, I think it was like transparency mask or mask layer on Krita, mm -hmm. uh, it didn't work. Like uh, it wasn't doing what you. Uh, hmm. Would, eh. What I had said, yeah. Yeah. Uh, were you using group? Uh, yes, uh, you went like uh, group and then cl quick clipping group, I believe. Yes. 
Yeah, I did that and it didn't help either. And then there's a letter A that it wants also. So I'm loading up Krita real fast just to demonstrate. So here we've got Krita. I'll use a solid brush to just make, let's just make it green. So here's a, a layer with nothing, solid green. Then it was group, quick clicking, clipping group. The key might be which layer to do your painting on. The bottom most layer is the masking shape now. So if I make a little extra blob over here, um, we'll be able to see pigment on that. The mask layer, which I'll change to reddish, is the one that is going to either be hidden by the lack of pixels on the original or shown because there are pixels down there. So that's how that works. Now, if this A isn't clicked, it won't work. If we do extra layers like this and their letter A isn't clicked, they won't work temporarily until that A is clicked. So maybe that explains a little bit. We could also paint on the background by going all the way down here. And then if I, let's get like something like this and paint whatever I want behind everything. Uh, we can even move the whole group as long as I click here. So here's the whole clipping mask group. Temporarily it looks transparent, when it, but when I hit enter, it goes back to being fully opaque. Does that help at all? Uh, yes, uh, but when I made the when I made the clip quick clipping group, the A was already selected, but it wasn't okay. still working. So I don't know. Probably my settings mm. are a little bit off or something. Or something. Um, if you take a screenshot of like your layers in your project, then I might be able to tell you uh, what's on the the screen or what's in the layers. Or we could have you share your screen at some point, and I could see what you're doing, and maybe I could figure it out by that. Okay. All right. Thank you. So yeah, given that obviously that was going to be pr be frustrating and it was going to prevent you from getting very far in this, it looks like you've got the base layer of color, but it's a little bit rough and isn't formed really really carefully yet. And it looks like you were trying to put shadows in. So we'll hold off on on judging that too much until we can get your your system working better. Oh, we just saw salvos right. All right, so we've got Trevor. Cool, we got another rhinoceros. And I'm seeing cast shadows. I'm not really seeing occlusion, but I am seeing nice base colors, a little bit sloppiness here and there, but for the most part working out. I'm thinking that Trevor used white for his initial fill because I'm seeing these little points here, here, all over the place that are showing little bits of white. Um, if you're using the clipping mask or even the transparency lock correctly, we shouldn't have to see that because you can just use a really big brush and just go all the way outside the lines. So for instance, and I'll just use Krita since I've still got it here. If I want to recolor that base layer, so I'll just hide those. This one up here, right now anything I paint is just going to go wherever it pleases. I don't have my brush. There we go. Why don't I maximize that? It's just going to go wherever. But if I lock the transparency with this checkerboard, and in Photoshop we've got an equivalent button for that, now I can paint wherever I please. But I don't want to carefully trace this out again. I just want to go straight over the edge so there's no chance of that green showing through at all. Okay, We can do that for any of these layers. If I've already got one and I like it, but it needs additional detailing, lock the transparency, change the color to something else. And now I can only edit where that color already is. Okay. Turn off this and you can see there it goes all over the place. Turn that back on. There we go. Okay. So that's what I'm assuming is happening because I'm seeing these kind of messy little white lines all over the place. So be sure to use a nice big brush, go slow, shape carefully. Um, the primary shadow looks okay. So we've got kind of following the contour around in a way that makes sense, but I'm not seeing any of the occlusion. So that would be the very blurry parts where everything is touching. So we'd get some in here and we'd get some on the front of the hat going along here. We'd probably get some here, uh, inside the ear a little bit. I'm only really seeing direct light right now. So we're kind of missing that additional step to make it look a little bit more uh, volumetric. So hopefully, 
uh, when he gets that, he'll kind of see what was going on there. All right. Let's see, Rudy. So Rudy, we got the basic raccoon, a little bit of stuff kind of messing up here and there. Looks like um, we've got these thick black lines, which in the homework I was saying, I wanted all the lines gone. So we want to make sure that we don't have any lines remaining and that our painting is only defined by uh, color differences and shading differences. So don't trace back over all these edges. That was something I explicitly said not to do. Uh, also, just like the other person, make sure to fill that in because the arm is supposed to free float in front. As far as light and shadow, I'm only seeing a little bit and it looks like you're kind of struggling with the tool. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. I, I don't really see light and shadow. It looks like you're kind of struggling to do the first couple steps. Yeah. Yeah? Uh, yeah, I was struggling at the first couple of steps. Okay. Do you know what went wrong, or do you just want to like try to watch the video again and see? I'm gonna try to watch it again and okay. see. I think, I think the part when you just like taking in the white, and, and I think that's why we went wrong. Or like try to like make the sucker. Yeah, the first part, just filling in white for everything, should be the first step. Just a silhouette, and then we lock it. Then the second step on that part is filling in the local colors, but I didn't do any of that until the end because really the light and dark was most of the task. And so those are done on a different layer. But yeah, getting the base color should be something you can do. And then just don't concern yourself with the, the edges. Make sure it's just white and green and red and brown. That's it. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Thank you. Elias. Very good. Okay. Oh, what was the comment I didn't see? Um, this is hard and a good challenge, though. It would be cool if we revisited this topic somehow, or I could just practice my free time. Yeah, this is the beginning of painting period. So we will be painting probably for the rest of the course, for sure. And yeah, absolutely, you should practice this. There are a lot of different ways to do it, like I said initially. But um, this is one of the most popular in terms of complexity. So yeah, I think you've got the a pretty good handle on this. We can see a cast shadow on the left on the background, which is cool. Um, and so we've got illuminated surfaces on the right with shadows wrapping around these. You could be a little bit more generous with the shadows and have them come out just a bit farther, I think. Uh, I like the shadow on the neckerchief. Try to follow those shapes though. So I see a shadow down here, and then we hit this um, little sticking out part of the neckerchief. That means that this is closer to us, so this should probably curve up and around it a little bit. Um, same thing with this knot. It would probably be a little bit higher up since that's sticking out farther away from where the shadow would have been. And that sort of difference in height will give us a lot of detail. Um, you're doing a good job right here in the nose of showing us that there's a cast shadow from the nose, and then here's the nose, but we're not seeing the turning form shadow on the actual nose itself, right? So this this nose is a cone it would be wrapping around which is just like the head on this far side of the nose we'd get a little bit of a soft shadow poking in here and that would give us a full feeling of it being three-dimensional so you got the cast shadow just not the wrapping shadow okay and all of this stuff is kind of a study of like light and observational drawing that you guys are going to have to fill in and supplement on your own because that's fundamental art stuff and not necessarily about digital art just how do shadows cast where do they go how do you form them that sort of thing so we've got a pretty good general approach here and it looks like you used all the techniques correctly uh, one little part I see is that the shadow color here I'm not sure which is which like I think either this is paint or that's shadow if it's shadow then the layer maybe wasn't set to multiply it was just kind of a grayish brown color because it doesn't look like it's darkening this it looks like it's actually lighter so I'm not sure if that's what happened there it's supposed to be some kind of light but I was pretty tired near the end it's mm, yeah I mean I see what you're thinking but it didn't really work in this case um, part of the reason that I did it the way I did is because we don't have to worry about light and dark we only have to worry about dark and it makes the job a little bit simpler because really something is either 
illuminated and we get the light colors on it already or it's in shadow and we get whatever bounce and environment colors the only exception is shiny things and generally you don't want everything to be shiny only stuff that would have like a glossy finish like the eyes the nose maybe the buttons that sort of thing but definitely a good attempt here very good all right so we got uh, not one of the characters that I provided so where are you? Are you in the, the chat? So you keep doing this, um, Lilia. You keep doing uh, assignments that are not what I actually provided. And you got to read the assignment and use the resources I'm providing you because it's going to start setting you behind. Uh, you probably had to work a lot harder because you had to draw the entire character first. But I, I gave people characters to use, and you're not utilizing that. So. You're going to be fighting uphill this entire time. I know that you did this last time on the assignment, um, did something that I didn't provide based on reference either, um, and it's hurting you every time. So pay a little bit closer attention to what the requirements are and try to satisfy those requirements rather than just kind of doing your own thing because you're not really going to learn very much by doing that. Um, with that said, there's no light on this at all. Like I don't see any shadows or, or lights. I guess I see one tiny little one right here. And, and on his head, but it's it's nowhere near what I was describing and what I was demonstrating uh, on our demo day. So make sure that you watch the video, pay attention to what I'm doing, and try to follow along with my uh, instructions because otherwise you're just going to keep doing things the way that you're already doing and there's no point in learning from me. Okay? All right. And if you have any trouble getting a hold of those resources, let me know because I can help you figure out how to get them. All right, Crystal. Crystal did a pretty decent job here as well. I think we're missing the color on the buttons down there is all. And maybe the color of the nose, because I believe the nose is supposed to be black in the reference just to kind of set it out. But that said, the, the light and dark here looks pretty good. I'm having a small bit of trouble figuring out where the light source is coming from and going to. Let's see. Just want to make sure there wasn't like a second part to it uh, because it looks all a little bit general and the shadows kind of look like they're going in different directions is she here let's see i don't think i see her in the chat but hopefully she'll watch the recording um it's pretty good though i just see a shadow coming to the left here which would indicate light over here and then i see a shadow here which looks like it would be coming from the left shining towards the right or straight down and so those things don't match up. There's also something here, and I'm not sure what that is. Like that's maybe this thing having light from the bottom left. So none of the shadows really seem to match up, which gives this feeling of it being like overcast or something. But really we need to decide, here's where the light's coming from. Here's the side that will be light, the side that will be dark, and commit to that. And the other pass, the occlusion pass, which is kind of what's going on in the hat here, um, is really much more subdued than the primary light pass. So I think that she's probably doing it correctly, but a bit too vague and needs to um, try to try to pin down where the light is coming from a little bit more specifically, and that will probably help. Right. Uh, who's this? Robert. Cool. Yep, so we got a shadow cast back over here generally light on the front you tuck the arm back too everybody's doing that today uh, shadow on the right hand side light on the front left front left uh, yeah generally working pretty good I think one part where it's not is over here in the nose because the shadows aren't deep enough to tell the difference between the nose that's sticking in front and the mask that's behind we need something to help us to differentiate those two and it would probably be some kind of turning form shadow on the bottom part of this nose area. Same sort of thing is happening like up in the ears where we're already in shadow, but this is at a different angle from the head. So probably there should be some tone difference there and maybe even just cheating a little bit with a tiny little turning form shadow here on the lip of the ear or here on the lip of the ear to kind of push that idea a little bit farther. He almost looks like he's got a Starbucks barista kind of, uh, uh, apron on right now, which would kind of be a, a further funny tie-in. 
Uh, yeah. So any comments from you? Problems? No. No? no. So generally pretty good, I would say. Just uh, try to differentiate what's in front of and behind a little bit stronger. Okay. Very good. It may be that, uh, now that I think about it, it may be that your base colors are a little bit too dark because that will make this harder. So maybe lighten up the base colors a little bit and then let the shadow do the work. All right. Well, now that's a really crisp one. So we got Sophie. So this almost looks like a vector illustration as opposed to a, uh, a painting but it looks like we're doing at least the base color and shadowing just fine and i really do like the shadow cast by the upper part of the glasses on the eyes that's pretty cool the only thing that we're lacking based on the painting demonstration is the soft transition of these turning form shadows and the soft occlusion based shadowing that would happen because things are just nearby each other if we added that stuff in we'd kind of lose the style but we would gain a more three-dimensional sense of this character. So I don't know if Sophie's in the chat. I don't see her. But it's a really nice looking illustration, just not exactly what I was asking for in the assignment prompt. So I would say try to soften these turning form shadows just a bit. All you need is an airbrush eraser or a airbrush, typical brush, and just like make them come in farther. Um, wherever there is a round shape, that's going to happen more. Wherever it's cast, that's going to happen a lot less. So these could stay nice and sharp. This would be blurry. These would be blurrier on his, uh, on his pants, on his shirt, on his apron. Um, but this cast shadow like underneath the um, neckerchief would be sharper, like you've already got it. Okay, Pretty nice looking though, nice and clean at least. Cool. So this one is... Um, Yesenia, okay, this looks pretty great. We've got nice colors. We've got a nice kind of contact idea of the things touching each other kind of have a small dark crease in between the two so we can tell the difference. I see the turning form shadows. I see some cast shadows, but it's all running together and making it a little bit hard to tell where the light is coming from still. Um, I want to say it's upper left because I see this line here, the shadow direction is going this way. There's a shadow on the bottom of this, cast shadow from the glasses. So I want to say it's like high upper left is where the light is coming from, but the occlusion is competing with the cast shadows and turning form shadows to the point that it makes a little bit harder to tell. Um, this one is one that I have a question about because it's so dark. It looks like that's maybe intended as a cast shadow, but if it were, then this part of the hat would need to be dark as well. Um, if that is a contact shadow, like a, an occlusion, it's a bit too severe and we'd have it on the hat as well. So it's always on both sides. Whatever is occluding, um, both of those surfaces play a role and so they both have equal amounts of occlusion on them typically, if we can see those surfaces. Got it, okay. Yeah, but overall, pretty good. Very nice. Any questions or comments you got since you're here? No? Okay. Thank you. Andrew. Cool. So we've got a nice base color for the fur, mask, hat. Yep. A little bit rough on the shaping though, right? It looks like... Um, you went through with a brush, got that edge, but didn't really clean that edge up very much. And it's pretty critical that you do that because everything is very visible with this technique. Um, I was mentioning to some students, I don't know if it was in your guys' class or not, that this is not my fav favorite technique to use because it's so exacting and unforgiving. To make this edge, you have to very carefully, perfectly sculpt this out or we're going to see all the little bumps and bruises. But if we do something a little bit more like traditional painting, we've got bumps and bruises and, and brush strokes everywhere all the time, and it hides those little mistakes and makes it more forgiving. The downside is you have to take full responsibility for all color and shading all on one layer or just a couple layers, and that becomes way harder to do. So you've done a pretty good job here, but just concentrate a little bit more on nice, smooth shaping of those base colors. Down to shadows, I see some shadows, but not all. So we've got this nice cast shadow on this, 
but not on this side. And it's like, well, they're they're both shining on the same object and they're about the same, you know, spacing away from the surface. And I think we should have a cast shadow under that too, but we're kind of missing it. Um, I don't see anything on the base of the hat. So I don't think we have any occlusion as far as I'm aware. We've got just kind of turning form shadows sometimes and cast shadows in some places. So it's a little inconsistent. I suspect that maybe there was either some confusion or a little bit of trouble making it work properly. Um, I don't see him in the chat, so we'll leave it to him to ask questions at some point. But I think that's maybe what went on either um, didn't get enough time put into it to complete it or was a little bit confused about where to go at some point. Okay, so we've got one. One's got a nice severe uh, lighting from the side where we've got a very clear shadow on the right hand side of everything with the left hand side being illuminated. Um, okay, so in some cases like in the neckerchief, you're kind of cutting the neckerchief right in half which is probably not the best idea, um, even if that is what is really happening, which is sometimes it looks a bit strange and you might want to cheat it a little bit further to the shadow side or to the light side. Uh, mostly it's because we're on the light side of the body. This neckerchief is on the body. This neckerchief should be in light, right? If we've got this big shadow over here, then we would be in the shadow side. If we've got this big light over here, we'd be on the light side. So this would have to straddle this light dark line in order to kind of make sense like that, where it just doesn't look like a shadow really belongs there at this angle. I would say that we would probably get a small sliver of shadow on this four facing one. And on this side one, we would get a slightly more substantial shadow, just not quite as much as you've got there, maybe the last quarter or something like that. On the neckerchief, we'd probably have one sliver here, one slight sliver here um, from that side lighting. And it also looks like you may have left um, the wrong layer on top because it's cutting into his face right now. So make sure that his face passes at least over this because that's the back of the neckerchief. Although the knot can be in front, this part definitely shouldn't. It's something weird that's happening that kind of breaks that illusion. Um, generally doing, I think, the right thing probably just need a bit more practice and experience with this technique. Um, this one is a little bit questionable, the, the light on the tail, because the direction of your shadow is basically sideways. So having this illuminated says it's curling around to the front or to the back and poking around his body. Because if it's just that it's away from his body and light would be coming from the top, the shadow direction says, no, it wouldn't. The light's only coming from the left right now. So a little bit of a confusion there, I think. I see ones here. You got any questions or comments, Juan? Hang on, I'm turning your volume up a little bit. Say one more time. Yeah, and that comes from observational drawing and kind of a study of 3D primitives. Um, that's perfectly understandable. Just try to do a little bit of practice on like cylinders, cubes, and spheres when you get a chance in your spare time, and it will start to make that stuff clear. Or if this exercise was fun, keep doing it with this, but try to like observe little toys in your house or something and light them with a flashlight and move it around and see how the light forms itself, because that will start to answer some of those questions. But yeah, this is like a, a higher level problem than really we're dealing with in this class. The lower level problems of using these techniques, it seems like you're doing all of that right. Cool. Thank you. All right. Oh, it's adorable. We've got Tiffany with this uh, strawberry shortcake rhinoceros here. Uh, the only thing I'll say immediately is probably pick a slightly darker background color because it starts to bleed into these um, cream colored, um, what would, they're not, those aren't paws, cream colored toes, hooves, yeah. So it starts to bleed into that and it's a little bit hard to differentiate between like the white of the, the shirt and the hooves and the background. The head it's working just fine in the strawberry but it's just a little bit strange right there. Um, generally seems to be working okay. The shadows are really, really subtle. 
and I only really see cast shadows off the character, which would be on the background. When we're supposed to have cast shadows on the character as well, it's possible they're here and they're just really, really thin, but try to get them a little bit farther away from the object of origin because that's going to help us to tell what the direction is. I see turning form shadows, but they're very, very light. I think that maybe um, she was a little afraid of darkening things because it would ruin the colors, but really you need to start getting a little bit more bold with those things and allowing them to darken because we're not seeing any form um, yet because that stuff's too light. Also slightly odd that we've got a shadow on top of the hat and we've got a shadow on the bottom of the face. So those are two different directions. That's as if there was something floating in midair like right here on her horn or something. Try to keep it consistent. Pick the same side for all the objects in general unless we've got some special effect in mind like a local light source like a candle or a floating pixie or something like that. Okay. Um, generally base colors look okay. I think you're using the techniques fine. We just need to be more bold and specific about those shadows. All right, and that is everybody. We all did it. Congratulations. You did it. You survived. Uh, let me very quickly show you guys my pug file because I do still have it. Let's see if that is this on my desktop. Let's see, pug. There we go. I'll show you guys my pug file just to show you where I ended up in terms of layers and stuff as a sort of comparison. Um, I started putting a background on it at some point because without that it seemed a bit empty. Um, I was experimenting with special effects lights because if you remember my original concept was of this heavenly hot dog but I just didn't get quite far enough for that. Um, so I'll turn those off. I had also done a very slight experiment with just providing kind of shiny light sources on certain parts. I think I would still do that, but I would want to relegate it only to the shiniest bits. However, like dog or pet hair does have kind of a specularity to it. And specular is another word for that shininess. So maybe I should have left that, but you can even see it's um, badly shaped because it's going around the nose here and it's on top. So I'd have to erase away some of that so it's not interfering with that. Um, here are some like specular highlights that was an experiment as well, leaving that off for the moment. This is just a copy of the shadows to show what the sharp shadows looked like. Let's get rid of all that. Actually, let's, yeah, let's go all the way back down here. So here's what the sharp shadows looked like. And then here's what the shadows looked like after softening. So it's, there's quite a difference. And also they're, they're turned down a bit in terms of intensity, but Everywhere, and I'll, I guess I'll turn on the pencils so that we can see that. Everywhere that the object is round, basically, I've softened out the shadow to be far, far wider than it began while still trying to mimic that original shape. So if you look real close, you can kind of see that they're still following these semicircular patterns, but now, I, I actually also moved it up the head, it looks like. Uh, a little bit, but now they're way, way softer than they were before. So all of these lines, I would expect this line to be soft, that one to be soft, um, even these little ones on the nose, the cast shadow of the nose, probably not. So let's see. Yeah, there we go. So very, very soft, very, very soft. These ones soft, but it is a very small object, so you can't soften too much. The cast shadow of the nose is by far the sharpest part of that area because it's not going to really it's not going to really do that. Um, the reason why it's a little bit soft at the end is that the farther away from the object of origin you get, the more blurry it's going to get. And also it's turning along this curving muzzle. So if it's being cast along something else curving, not only will it lengthen, it'll also soften a bit there too. So it's sort of like soften in proportion to um, how curvy the object is and how large it is. You can see this nice sharp line because we're not doing occlusion in this step. Um, this is the crease between the nose fat, whatever we want to call that, and the forehead wrinkles. But this is the top of that object, so it would be perfectly bright. Those ones are losing their form back into this crease, and so they're coming into um, full shadow. So when we add the occlusion in there, you can see 
the wrinkle area is where that occlusion is applied. And just like I was mentioning in um, some of our review, it's kind of applied evenly on both sides. So we don't get a super specific kind of feeling of form with this because the foreground part and the background part, they're both gonna take on this occlusion light. But when I add the sharp shadow back in, you can see the effect. And if I really add the blur shadow in, which has been more specific, we get a much, much stronger effect. Okay, but like I said, getting that stuff correct is more about observational drawing, traditional painting, um, maybe observing photographically or learning 3D rendering techniques. Um, it's kind of outside the scope of the class, but just to give you an idea of how that stuff is supposed to apply. I also went farther than this. So I've got this layer one, it's not labeled because I don't really know what to call it. I guess we could call it creases, okay? So if I turn those other two layers off, this is what it is. And it's just everywhere where I thought the crease was dark enough to warrant even more of a hard occlusion shadow down deep inside of those areas. So if I do base occlusion plus that, probably that extra layer is just this occlusion done more specifically and I should just combine them. But I left them separate because I liked having the ability to adjust it up and down a little bit. I even provide a little surface texture here because when I looked at pictures of pugs, they have uh, a lot of turbulence there where all the whiskers kind of slot in. So deep in the mouth, underneath some of these wrinkles in places where um, the folds are really dark and generally just to kind of give it better definition. So this is all I really lectured on, right? Occlusion and shadow. When I added this extra bit to it it felt much better and so I don't quite know what to call that except for like extra crease I suppose and I'm even seeing now that it's um, isolated I was doing all of this on top of color um, where both colors on top of all these colors but now that it's isolated which is gray I can see places that I would do more like underneath this eyeball I would probably increase the amount of darkness on that particular pass um, and then as going down the body, probably underneath the neck waddles and stuff for the, the rest of the dog eventually. Okay, So to turn all of that back on, here's our um, additional colors, right? These are layers on top of the gray. You can see it doesn't quite match up, but it ends up not mattering when I have the dark colors like this. And then probably not those, maybe that, maybe that and that would end up being the final along with some specular on the eyes that I'd have to figure out better. But if we're just gonna turn that stuff off, then you can see that's basically where I ended up with mine. I even think that my base colors are probably a bit dark themselves, which there are adjustment layers that we can use to um, mess around with that. For instance, I could just double click this and do a color overlay, but color overlays don't combine especially well. Let's, uh, with additional layers. We kind of have to merge everything you can see. It's just kind of, it's taking all of those additional layers and including it, which is unfortunate because they're in a clipping mask. So we can't exactly do that. I could put an adjustment layer, let's see, hue saturation adjustment layer right here inside the clipping mask underneath all those other layers. So now I could take the lightness up. Let's make it a little bit more saturated so it's not so strange. Could slide the lights around somewhere to slightly warmer. Let's see, where's the yellow? It's probably right about here, something like that. And then you can also change this adjustment layer to itself be a blending layer, but that gets kind of confusing to figure out what exactly is going on. It's not like just dropping a big color over everything. Okay, so I'll go back to normal with that, but we can turn the opacity down a little bit. So here's no effect. Here as I turn it up, we start to see more detail in the shadows at the expense that it looks a little bit washed out. So probably a few extra passes on this would be um, called for. One thing I like to do though, is we could color the occlusion and the shadows independently of each other, which would give a, uh, a better environmental feeling of light. If you think about it, the light from the environment is mostly going to show up in the occlusion 
no, sorry, the, the light from the environment is mostly going to show up in the shadows, period. So it's going to show up in the cast and turning form shadows and the occlusion shadows, all of them, right? Um, the lit parts are being hit by the light sources. So whatever color that light is, if it is a color, that's where that's going to show up. So let's just try really quick because I think it's a, a fascinating thing to do. If I, I think I can do a color overlay on the shadows. Yeah, because they're just transparency. So if I make, um, let's just go for blue. If I make all these shadows bluer like that, <laughs> it looks really funny, especially since it's too light. But let's see if I can make it darker. Bring that back. So something like that looks a little bit nicer now. And then I could probably take this one and shift it much farther along the color spectrum to get some sort of cool combined effect, like over towards green or something. Let's see. Zombie pug. Yeah, I'm going to try to make the shadows more colorful now. But then I probably have to turn the opacity higher. There we go. So now we've got like this greenish sickly light and this blue shadow color down here. We could keep going with all of them, but if done, if set up really correctly, then you can use this to adjust light in a painting, which is a really cool thing to be able to do. Um, cool. Everybody good? Questions? Is this is this something that will be taught in the next version of this class? Um, we don't know what that B is going to be until the teacher is chosen for that quarter. So the advanced concept would be everything fancy that we know how to do that has to do with coming up with ideas, painting and, and presenting them, the two-dimensional part of production art. Um, for me, yes, I suppose this would be part of it. Like, I'm not even sure what my version of that class would be, but for another instructor, it would be different for them. All right. Like, does that make sense? It could be storyboard. It could be, um, it could be texturing 3D objects. It could be special effects and post-processing. It could be um, painting like fine art painting. We don't really know. And also, it's, a little, it's more up to the student as well that we can have a curriculum and we can lecture on whatever we want. But if you want to focus on matte painting, matte painting is painting the backgrounds that occur in large films and in the sky boxes of games, then that's on you. That's great. And we would help you out any way we can. But if you don't and you have something else that you want to focus on, we'd help you with that. Um, I could do it definitely for like three dimensional animation drawing for one which is a kind of production um, that maybe we aren't specifically geared for at Norco, but um, I could definitely teach because it's one of my specialties. Um, we could teach more three-dimensional kind of sculpting type of painting. We could do graphic design. Don't really know. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm just curious if this is something that we might be covering and all that. I mean, it's something I can cover. If you ask me advice about it, I'll give it to you. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> All right, you guys. There we go. I think we're just about done. If you guys have any final questions, go ahead and ask me. If not, then that's uh, going to be it. Yes, I, I have a, a, a question because I have a bit of an issue with the assignment that is due today. Uh, yesterday, I, I was working on it for couple hours, had all my layers, went through the steps and everything, saved the file, and I opened it up today to finish it and it merged all of my layers. Mm. So I'm not sure what to do with it because all the line work is still there and all I need to do is just okay. colorize it. Is What is the file it. extension of your project? Like you see up here, I'm circling it right now, pugboy.psd. Um, what is the I file extension? That is the issue because uh, I think it's saved as a JPEG. Yeah. Then... Unless you can find it in files recent, open recent, if it's in this list, then you can find it and open it. If it's not, then it's just gone because you didn't save as a, a native file. So one of the first things to do for future references, save as a native file, native to your program. So in the case of Photoshop, it's a PSD. In the um, 
case of Krita, it's a KRA. I don't know what Sai uses, probably Sai, S-A-I. But save that file because it saves all of the functional stuff like layers and blending modes and what have you. Any normal image format such as PNG, JPEG, GIF, whatever, they are not going to save that stuff. So I right. think um, I think you could just work on top of what you have already and try to salvage it or start over. But just turn in what you have regardless to, to get a partial grade. Um, you can always fix things later. So um, I, I don't have the, the previous Krita file. It, I only have the PNG, so I'd have to try to salvage it. But yeah, um, unfortunately, how would I go? Because all I need to do is just colorize it. How I have all the shadows and I have oh, all, all the really? stuff like that, but I'm not sure how to okay. get rid of the line work. The line work um, part is probably impossible, but the shadow thing we can do. Um, so let's just pretend like this that I've got is grayscale entirely. In fact, I'll put my line work on there as well to give an idea. I'm going to convert this all to grayscale just by at the very top sliding this saturation slider to zero. So you've got something like this then. Yeah. Okay. okay. So I'll go above this and let's pick a color. Well, I've got red, so fine. I'm going to paint red on this layer above everything. We'll just paint it right here. Oh. What's going on? There it goes. I'm just going to paint red. And then I'm going to set this layer to color. And so now it is colored underneath while preserving all that luminosity. Um, we could also try, well, hue's probably not going to do it. Saturation won't do anything. Yeah, it's going to have to be color. Although overlay, overlay is potentially, let's try a few. Vivid light. Ooh. Is that the same for Krita? Yeah, it has all these options as well. And and they have different ones as well. So there's definitely going to be a color one at the very least. So what that means is with color, and if it's too much, I could turn it down a tad. I should be able to figure what sort of color do I actually want there. Let's try to get this beige back again and just go over those bits. And I, I guess I just won't be careful then pick the other color that I would want, like brown, and go over those portions like this, and just kind of do it that way. So yeah, you can colorize a black and white thing fairly quickly. And in fact, some people's painting method works explicitly like that. They, they do a whole black and white concept without any color, and then at the very end add color. So that's potentially something that you could do. Let's get this pink. That didn't change very much. You may need more than one of these layers in order to get differing levels of like intensity. So let's just copy this for a moment. And then on this second one, I'll set it to overlay and turn it farther down. So now I'm getting a little bit more intensity with the combination. The problem is that all the colors I'm picking are semi-transparent and they're merging together. So you can't color sample like this. You've got to save the colors that you picked the first time to apply uh, onto these semi-transparent layers. But you can get a pretty fully colorized image that way eventually. Oop, that's far too bright. Or I meant far too saturated. But yeah, it may take a little bit of doing to get specifically the kind of color blending and effects that you want. But at the very least, we can apply color over the top of something this way. And if you turn it down, it gets more and more subtle until it's gone. Does that help? All right. That, that helps a lot. I'll have to take a hit on the line work, but thank you. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, it's it's all been flattened. And so it's either start over or try to do the work again on top of what you've already got. Um, you can see that in this case, if this were the art that I had, the line work is pretty hard to notice. And so I think I would just keep going and just deal with that. But if it was far more visible like this, there would just be nothing for it. I'd have to just go over the top of it again. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you. All right. Anybody else? Questions, comments?
Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, when you added uh, that like extra bit of occlusion shadow, um, what kind of brush did did you use? I don't know. Let's see. Um, soft. Pretty soft. Um, it looks like I was still using an airbrush, but very, very small airbrush. And then occasionally sharpening the line a little bit, but not really very much. Like the only place I can see the line sharpened is like on the top of the nose and where the tongue over here is in front. And so clearly that layer should not be darkening the tongue in that area. Um, it's the same as the occlusion, really. So the occlusion is a very blurry, wide, soft brush. This one is just a little bit tighter and denser. So almost sort of like a transition in occlusion from the darkest to the light, lightest tones. Probably, and I suspect, I, would, I just wasn't thinking, and these two should just be both occlusion, but separating it like this helped me conceptually um, to, to work on it in pieces a little bit more comfortably. That's all. Okay. Cool. Yeah, you can see here's the shadows, cast shadows and, and turning forms without either of those. Here it is with just those crevices. That works pretty well by itself. Here it is with just the occlusion. That works. It's just a little bit more general. Both of them together, though, I think is the best case. And we get a very, very sculptural look. Okay. I'm tempted to just like leave off all the colors and make this a dog statue. Oh, you guys don't have to hate UI so much. UI's fun. A little bit of vector, a yeah, okay. little bit of fonts. You wouldn't get it. <laughs> I wouldn't get it? Why? What happened to you guys? One year UI development. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Send you back to, to that terrible time. <laughs> yes. All right, you guys. I think that's going to be it. Thank you very much. And we will see each other on Friday.